Hello ladies and gentlemen, uh, sorry for the issues with the mic in the beginning. Uh, welcome to our uh, first lecture after a break. Uh, we will be, we are recording in a new location. I'm recording at AGH. Hopefully there are no issues with the uh, connection and the quality is acceptable for everyone. Uh, today we will discuss the Hamiltonian Monte Carlo uh, we'll discuss Hamiltonian Monte Carlo uh, algorithm, at least we start with that. Then we will move to some the time, uh, time constraints allowing, we will move to some example of different likelihoods and modeling techniques. And uh, it's not exactly what I intended for the initial plan of this lecture, but well, plans change. Uh, so, to uh, give us a brief reminder of what we were talking before. Initially, we have worked on the, uh, we have covered multiple methods of sampling of probability distributions because that's the only way that we can get the uh, data for the, then we got get information about probability distributions to get some, uh, some results. And uh, for this purpose, uh, we show that Monte Carlo estimators are very efficient for finding such solutions and uh, that we can use them to create estimators of expectation values of multiple functions. The issue, of course, is that Monte Carlo estimators by themselves are very difficult to create as they will require us, uh, from us uh, ability to sample directly from the uh, probability distribution, which is simple in scalar cases. It is, however, very difficult in the more complicated cases, especially that in the uh, in case of uh, practical Bayesian computation, we do not actually have the ability to uh, construct a formula for probability distribution. We can only construct the probability uh, the proportional uh, the, the function that is proportional to the probability distribution because the uh, denominator of the function is the uh, or the probability distribution is com uh, untraceable computationally. That is, we would require to uh, marginalize all the parameters in order to verify the, the so-called evidence. So, having Monte Carlo, traditional Monte Carlo out of the way, we have to move to Mont Markov chain Monte Carlo, which is a methodology for generating samples by walking, uh, uh, by traversing over the typical set of the probability distribution by creating samples that will stay inside this uh, uh, typical set. And we've discussed that uh, if Markov chain is, uh, uh, has a stationary distribution, which is, uh, then it con its uh, samples converge to a typical set of st stationary distribution. And for example, using metropolis hasting algorithm, we can create a Markov chain that is the uh, that creates uh, 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 chain that creates the uh, sam uh, the samples uh, from uh, that we can create a mark of chain that its stationary distribution is equal to the desired distribution that we wanted. So why build on that? Because unfortunately we still have to uh, find a way of generating samples that consist of mark of chain and Traditional ways, like for example, random walk Markov chains, are, can be very inefficient. As we've seen, we have very small effective sample size, even for simple distributions, for complicated distributions, like distribution with funnels. We had an issue that we unfortunately uh, could get stuck in a funnel and uh, receive very low uh, effective sample size. So. Having that, what can we do about it? Well, uh, we can construct a more efficient algorithm that will uh, traverse the uh, distribution more efficiently. Generally, as I said, I mean, traditional Markov chain Monte Carlo generates samples that are with uh, small steps that will, would be covering the, our typical set. The idea for Hamiltonian Monte Carlo is to generate samples that are not as close to each other, so they have much lower autocorrelation between, uh, between them, uh, but they are 
uh, but they are uh, for, for the most spread around the typical set one from each other. So we need to find a way how to move through to this point through the typical set so, so, so farther away. And generating samples this way will be with much lower autocorrelation because they will be much more sparse from one each other and moreover will get a better a faster coverage of the entirety of the typical set and not just focus on the sample points here. So these are all the benefits for potential and Hamilton Monte Carlo is a method that will generate us such samples in the upright. But how to move out of the typical set? Because we have formulas for probability distribution, but as we already know, those formulas are practically useless because, first of all, we do not have the formula for the entire distribution. We only have a formula for its numerator, which is efficient. For the denominator, we cannot compute that. And so we cannot, from that, use direct, directly expectations or otherwise because of complicated integrations. However, we can know something about the curvature of the probability distribution from the derivatives of the probability distribution. Moreover, the movement around curves is often described using differential equations. Because all the move equations, as already started with Newton, uh, are behaving as a movement of the uh, curves in uh, the the of movement of curves. So mo having the equations of movement around the typical set would give us a very good result. But how to create those equations if we do not actually know the shape of typical set? First of all, because it's uh, we cannot determine it analytically. Second, it's by itself is not a curve, but it is a fuzzy surface of some kind. That uh, is uh, that has an unclear boundary. We just know where to look for, but it's not a defined uh, 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 set with a uh, with a boundary that we can. Read. So we want to move around a typical set, which is under some curvature, and we want to use this. Uh, we want to get a differential equation that will help us. And the general idea that said behind it is that one way of movement in space would be a movement of a material point on the curvature of probability distribution. So, if our point was moving around the probability distribution, which is a multidimensional uh, function, like a, like a in two dimensions, we could see as a mountain that we are moving around in more spaces than our intuition, more dimensions, our intuition will fail us. But generally, if we could find equations of moving around the surface, then we would be in a very comfortable situation. And the mind idea that movement of anything in the uh, equations of movement coming from the first. Uh, laws, uh, uh, sorry, for well, the second law of the dynamics of Newton, is require us the momentum and position. Classical uh, relation, uh, class, one of the formulations of second uh, rules of dynamics is that derivative of the momentum is the force acting on the object. Uh, and the momentum cl in classical is the mass times velocity, so it's proportional to the um, uh, proportional to the uh, velocity of the uh, other. So we have generally we to west. But in our case, we only have positions. So, because our parameters in our curvature of the probability distributions are the positions of point on the curvature or in the typical set. So the main idea standing behind construction of Hamilton integral is to add additional variables, those momentum variables that will allow us to move around the 
keep uh, the typical set. So it provides us with movement, but then as with, for example, face portrait, if you uh, remember it from control theory, we will just cast, uh, we will just perform the casting operation. So we will just drop out. We've moved in this extended space consisting of positions and momentums. And then after reaching our destinations, we just ignore momentums and we'll come back to the parameter space. So we just like, like on a face portrait, we will just remove, in face portrait, we remove time. Here we move, we move momentum. We reduce only to the movement in the position. So this point sliding of the surface, we could create equations for it using mechanical uh, uh, equations of mechanics consisting of velocities and momentums. And for that, is used so called Hamiltonian formalism, which adds auxiliary momentum variables. You should remember Hamiltonian formalism from the courses of mechanics uh, during your studies, if you study automatic control. Uh, it is also uh, present in physics when describing the, uh, the movement equations. Generally, the formalism relies on assigning variables for positions and for the uh, momentums. It can be extended, for example, to electrical values when the uh, positions and momentums are uh, becoming, for example, currents and the uh, and uh, voltages. By the way, my idea in Hamilton Monte Carlo is to define a Hamiltonian using the joint probability distribution for parameters and momentum variables, and we define it as an exponent. Negative uh, uh, exponent to negative of, uh, ham, uh, of the Hamiltonian function such that this distribution is negative. And this gives us the definition that a Hamiltonian is a logarithm of this uh, joint probability distribution, which is a result. Well, we do not know this function. However, using the well-known joint probability uh, formula, we can describe the joint probability of two variables as a product of probability of one variable and the conditional probability of the first one conditional on the, uh, of the second one conditional on the first one. If we are doing it in logarithm, the product, of course, becomes a sum. And because we have a negative value, it becomes a difference. And here, our Hamiltonian decomposes into two parts. First part is the potential energy, which is here, and the kinetic energy, which is here. Potential energy depends all in this formulation only on the position, or in our case, on the parameters. And because of that, it is completely defined by the probability density function that we are interested in, the probability density function of the function that we are located in. So this here is the, the completely defined by the curvature equations of the probability distribution we want to suffer from. So we are left with, so potential energy is known from the problem that we want to consider, so the probability distribution that we want to suffer. And the design choice leaves us with the kinetic energy, which we need to define in some efficient. Either way, knowing Hamiltonian, we can construct a system of differential equations that cover the evolution of both parameters and momentums using the derivatives of Hamiltonian. So, derivative of Hamiltonian with respect to uh, the momentums with a positive sign is an equation for the positions. And derivative of Hamiltonian with, with respect to positions is the differential equation for momentums. You can associate it also with the maximum principle and adjoint equations because this is generally exactly the same. Our momentums are our adjoint variables allowing us to consider the adjoint. Because of that, the equations are becoming much simpler. The equation for the position depends only on the derivative of 
energy with respect to the momentum and uh, of the kinetic energy to momentum and equation for the uh, momentums is that depends on the derivative of kinetic energy with respect to uh, with respect to positions and po uh, potential energy so the logarithm of probability distribution with respect to q so also to the parameters so here we get relatively simple uh, equations this part is not present here because potential energy does not uh, in this formulation does not depend on the uh, on the moment so general our algorithm is to sample momentum from the probability con conditional probability distribution of momentums conditional on positions so we start with a point in our uh, our uh, our probability space so our you know, parameters and using that point we get a random sample of momentums so this is a part of random sampling in our uh, in our Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. Then we use our po initial point Q and P, so previous value of parameters plus randomly generated momentums to solve the system of equations that we've seen before in order to get new points at the end of tra trajectory. And we can marginalize now the momentum just by dropping it. So just from the vector of two po of two vectors actually of parameters and momentums, we just ignore momentums and get new vector of parameters. And then we do some kind of test for to check the, the uh, metropolis casting condition. So can this sample be acceptable? Which is relatively simple. So we are generating a sample, we are verifying is it acceptable, if it's acceptable, then we are. This is of course very simple, and technically it's uh, a bit more difficult, and fortunately they are implemented in step. What really we need is kinetic energy, so how to define the kinetic energy. Then we need to know how to get the differential equations, because as you can see, it requires for us to, uh, to compute derivatives of the Hamiltonian with respect to two variables, which, and if you have multiple variables, this can potentially be complicated, and then how to efficiently cover the set, and this will cover using the NUTS, so, which is an abbreviation uh, not regarding the actual NUTS, but the no U turn sampling. We will not extensively discuss the choice of the energy, however, the most popular choice and the one used in Stan and Pine C, so the leading solution is the Gaussian and Euclidean Gaussian kinetic energy, which has a very nice property that Q uh, that is does not depend on the parameters. So the kinetic energy only depends on the kinetic uh, on the momentum variables, which then creates a, pro a conditional probability the distribution of P uh, with respect to, to Q, actually just a random normal walk from starting P, uh, the random walk, uh, random uh, normal distribution with a zero mean and a covariance matrix M. And what is covariance matrix M? Covariance matrix M is a matrix that we can tune up automatically, which is done during the warm-up period. That's why we are using 1000 samples per each Markov chain in order to appropriately select the energy. So select this matrix to cover the variations in parameters in an appropriate way, which we won't be covering here. But generally, the idea for adaptation of this uh, distribution is just to, uh, so that this distribution is efficient in covering our probability distribution. It depends on the scales of the momentums we respect to. But what's important, neither conditional momentum distribution nor the equations for the energy depend on uh, the uh, parameters of uh, which have been sampled, which is very useful as our equations drop another element here. So we are just dropping this part. This part does not exist. So it makes it everything very, very much more simple 
in the case of what we really want to do and this is the uh, this is a big advantage of this situation so that gives us the energy so how to get to differential equations derivatives of the uh, derivative of kinetic energy with to p is now ex uh, extremely simple it's just a multiplication of p and d uh, and uh, and matrix uh, matrix m so this is a simple gradient of a quadratic form however this part disappears and we need to compute derivatives of our probability distribution we can of course compute them analytically but it's usually not feasible to do so so we don't do it we use automatic differentiation so that's why it's important to in, to build the probabilistic uh, pro, uh, programming languages upon the uh, automatic differentiation libraries like Fiano or their own libraries so that's why it was built uh, well, uh, there was an attempt to build it on, upon the TensorFlow it's just needed in order to get the uh, automatic differentiation so we provide it with it with the formulas for probability distribution which are then being sampled that's why when we are specifying models for example in pi mc which we are not covering in this course but you can encounter it in different areas the problem uh, is that we need to use special function inside inside our python body that are coming from the Tiano library so all the function has to be uh, have to support the automatic differentiation in the encoding in order to be efficiently differentiated so generally equations differential equations are automatically generated from the probability distribution derivatives of uh, potential energy are, are so the logarithm of the probability distribution are computed directly and uh, uh, automatically uh, the, and the matrix M for the energy is estimated during sampling so this gives us the big advantage and that's why for example we in STEM we are not providing this usually this, we are formally not providing the, uh, distributions of the uh, parameters as as part of the distribution but we specify them as a logarithm so that's why we are using when you specify using target formats instead we are adding paths to the uh, probability distribution using lpdf function like with the suffix of uh, underscore lpdf which are used for the uh, uh, which are used uh, uh, for uh, construction probability distribution okay so now we have differential and those differential equations cover a movement around the curves of constant Hamiltonian because our equations consist only of the potential and kinetic energy. So the energy, either in the kinetic or potential form, is being preserved. However, because we do not introduce any kind of loss function that would introduce energy dissipation. So we need to solve these equations in a way that will preserve this property, which actually can be a bit difficult, especially for complicated equations, because traditional numerical methods like Runge-Kutta methods, which are often very efficient for solving some kind of uh, equation with some kind of dissipation, in case of energy preserving or Hamiltonian preserving equations, after some iterations, they start to uh, introduce artificial dissipation or artificial instability so our equation either numerically destabilize or numerically contract either way is bad for us because we want to have the property of uh, the uh, the property that is uh, preserving the, uh, the Hamiltonian and the, uh, and the, because then our equation will stay on the Hamiltonian curves that we are interested in, and the samples will be reasonably significant. And 
one class of differential equation methods that are very useful for that are so-called symplectic integrators. Symplectic integrators are a special class of differential uh, equation uh, solvers which preserve the Hamilton or preserved first, actually preserved the first integrals of the equations, which is a bit of differential theory that we are not, not really need right now. However, they keep uh, Hamiltonian in a very reasonable bounds. And this is very, uh, uh, very nice, but the issue is that symplectic integrators are usually inverse Runge-Kutta methods. So having an inverse Runge-Kutta method we have a problem that we would need to numerically solve certain system of nonlinear equations, which would be a very big problem. Fortunately, there is a one integrator that is very efficient for our purposes, which is called a leapfrog integrator, which generally works in a way that we are sampling, uh, we are solving uh, individually equation for momentum and equation for the uh, uh, and equations for the uh, position with steps moved about a half of, of a step from each other. And this is beneficial because the formulation, especially the one that uses Euclidean energy, simplifies drastically. And the parts of the equation that would require nonlinear solution are not present in the equation. So the equation has a much simpler form, and while formally a leapfrog integrator is an in, uh, implicit integrator, so the one requires solving on the equations, for the class of problems defined as we have here with Euclidean energy and Hamilton equations, it is explicit integrator. So we just use the uh, uh, formulas in a recurrent way without the need for artificial uh, for uh, solving differential uh, uh, algebraic equations and that's why leapfrog integrators is very popular uh, unfortunately leapfrog uh, symplectic integrators generally are only fixed step integrators what does it mean it means that we do not have an efficient method of step control that would allow us to adapt step from one step to each other in a meaningful way that would for us, especially that it was shown that the most efficient way of sampling from our equation is to sample in both directions of time, because we want not uh, we generally want to generate samples from our equations, and uh, so we want to move from here, we want to move to here, from, because, or actually we want to move far away from here along the typical. Side. It, it doesn't matter from us, it's just this way or that way. However, solving it in both directions in the same time is efficient because it helps stabilize numerically behavior of our samples. And moreover, we can generate samples from the trajectory in both directions and verify do they fulfill the metropolis hasting condition so we can generate an efficient sample from that. Only one sample is effective because we get a first sample that will just fit our conditions that are necessary from this curve. So we are solving for n bucket. And finally, there's one problem that needs to be addressed when finding solution is that when we are covering our typical set, moving from one point in both directions, there's always a risk that we will move too far along the typical set, which will cause that our initial movement from start to finish is closer just by covering the all the set around. This is called U-turn, so reversing of the direction. So we just like we were driving a car and we did a U-turn, so we're moving into the opposite direction that we started. And no U-turn sampling is a method that determines that such condition, so the sample string is stopped earlier, so the Monte Carlo chain does not move, uh, so the proposal does not consider a U-turn here, it just moves not far away, uh, so to get, uh, not, not too far in order to get 
in efficient solution. So these are the main fundamentals of modern Hamilton and Monte Carlo so, uh, solutions. So automatically adapted energy in Euclidean Gaussian form normally, automatic differentiations and symplectic integrators with backward and forward solutions with control of for the neutral uh, neutral side. And the fact that we are solving differential equations gives us one another benefit. Because those differential equations have to cover certain complicated geometry, there are issues that are typical for all kinds of differential equations that sometimes we uh, encounter numerical stiffness. That is the situation that our numerical solution destabilizes completely because of the numerical errors caused by the difficult shape that it needs to cover. In case of typical time uh, formulated differential equations, it is an issue when we have the equation where uh, the rate of change of trajectory is too fast for the integrator. So the situation when the uh, solution requires from us the uh, sample from the uh, uh, the solution that it requires, uh, uh, the solution requires us to get a minuscule step in order to cover situation. In fixed step solutions, it's a risk, a risky proposition. In case of the, uh, in case of uh, the uh, adaptive step, if the method is not efficient for in handling such situation, uh, it will get uh, cause us to create a sequence of very, very small steps that will be able to cover the complicated kink. In Hamilton and Monte Carlo, we are generally working on fixed uh, solvers, so we have problem of destabilization, which on the first look would be a big problem, and we want to find a method that would solve equations without the vertices. However, those areas of probability distributions, those kinks, those uh, uh, pinches, are natural phenomena occurring in badly specified models. If model is badly specified, then we have a problem because generally the typical set will be always difficult to cover. Either will require very long sampling with minuscule steps, or it will require uh, which in uh, large spaces of, of parameters can be a very big problem, or it's in those issues biases in something or the uh, which we we covered last time that biases were present. So such destabilization called the divergence is a warning sign from our algorithm. Okay, your problem might be difficult. Try to work something over it to cover the problem better to remove those divergences and it can be done either by adapting step because sometimes it's enough but sometimes you need to modify your model so it will not have problems with the behavior sometimes it's very simple it's a reparameterization into an equivalent model which we'll cover today here in so-called non-centered parameterization but uh, sometimes it's much more complicated when you need to change priors or you need to uh, do some incomplete uh, or partial reparameterization when you need to identify variables that are problematic in one aspect of sampling and the other. So this is this is something that requires a bit. So this was the theory. Now let's move to the some examples. Uh, we'll cover some examples regarding the uh, Monte Carlo sampling using Stan, and we'll cover them using the uh, we'll cover them using the uh, code in present here in Python. This is like some standard stuff that is needed for drawing, so we'll not be covering that, uh, that too much. We'll start with a simple normal model. We had considered that model before, which is here. Okay, this is a very, very simple model. We have a normal distribution. Previously, we've uh, described it. In the previous lecture, we've just described it as code, as a function using logarithmic formulation. Here, it's much simpler using sampling statement. We have two dimensional 
uh, normal distribution that is uh, that are completely uncorrelated variables with each other. First one is the uh, has a mean of one. Second one has a mean of uh, minus one. Both of us uh, the same standard deviation of my uh, of one. So we are something that using uh, uh, using Stan we are compiling this model. Model model works. We are something is something is very simple, very fast. No issues uh, are going here, and uh, we are uh, we will just see how those samples look like. So we generated some samples with uh, so-called thinning. So we got every ten samples to, to some better visualization. But here we will cover the same type of plots that we've discussed before. So the expanding mean. So we are using the estimators for our samples to estimate the variables Q, Q1 and Q2. And as we can see, we have very, uh, very nice convergence of our variables. This is some kind of artificial bias here that is happening where we could uh, uh, look for. But generally, initially, with small number of samples, the, some, uh, the aver averages are uh, initial uncertainty is large, which is being reduced with increasing number of samples. When we will look at the exploration of our data set, as we can see, it starts very well, even within warm-up, it uh, approaches the typical set very well, then it generates more samples. As you can see, those less visible ones are the domo transplant area samples, uh, the four ones are, are uh, the uh, samples later, so we first start with 150 of initial samples, then we have the uh, the rest of them. So for now, first is initial 100 samples, so it's here, then uh, next 50 samples, and then the rest of the samples, again, thinned to get the, uh, and get the results, and yeah, as you can see, the, the coverage, of course, is very efficient, which is shouldn't be surprising in case of sampling of a normal distribution. Uh, however, we can uh, move to a more advanced example, the example of the funnel distribution that we've discussed last time. Here, it is much more visible than uh, in the code that describes the prob uh, probability distribution, which is given here, uh, but generally, it is um, a variable that, that uh, it's a system that has d d uh, variables. First two variables here are me and log tau. So we are having general mean of our distribution. We have specified the logarithm of tau. So we have specified the logarithm of standard deviation and we are specifying additional parameters which are distributed depending on our mean and on the standard uh, the uh, standard deviation moved from the logarithm so we start the logarithm standard deviation which is exponentiated to get standard deviation in this way we don't have a problem of uh, the fact that standard deviation has to be um, positive. However, as you can see here, we've assigned a very wide prior on the log tau. This prior gives us the possibility that for the 97% standard logarithm of standard deviation can be between minus 10 up to 10. And after logarithm of that, that you can get standard deviations from the value of 10 to minus or e x of, uh, of minus 10, which is uh, equal to uh, 0 0.0004 up to x of 10, which is uh, a very large number. So generally, we can have very wide standard deviation, and that's of course problematic for our. Uh, also, because getting our samples will get some issues. And 
uh, we are sampling from our model, of course, again, like pre previous situation, and we can see the summaries. First of all, we have very inefficient number of active samples, but still the number of active samples, if you remember from the previous lecture, is higher than previous. Previously, it was, it was terrible. It was getting on the level of minus. Uh, it was lab, uh, getting on the level uh, level of one to some effective samples from uh, four thousand. So here it's a bit better. The biggest issue is Loctaw. Loctaw is least efficient in sampling, but as you can see, Loctaw has values from uh, large spread of values, uh, which are then uh, actually not very well uh, covered because. We would expect that Loctaw would have mean of zero and standard deviation of five, and here we have a mean of six and standard deviation of two point seven. So there are some big issues with sampling of Loctaw, and uh, their values of theta i are of course the giant spreads because they are depend on mean and uh, Markov uh, and standard deviation, and also you can see the Markov chain standard errors are significant for this. And when diagnosing this model, as we can see, 816, so 20% uh, of, the, uh, of uh, the samples are getting uh, uh, so-called maximum tree depth. So we are getting too many samples in one trajectories. And uh, because of that, we have problems with something. Uh, and uh, it suggests us increasing this limit, which is not necessarily a good idea in this case. Sometimes it is. It generally is how far we are exploring in doing one trajectory of the probability distribution uh, of the trajectory on the, uh, on the typical set, and moreover, 32 transition and the, in, with the divergence. And this is very important. Divergences, it's not like having one or two divergences is acceptable. Generally, divergences are not acceptable because they only they show that there are issues that can destabilize you. And those issues might appear in multiple places and also suggest that there is complicated uh, geometry. So number of divergences that we should be happy uh, with is zero. This is the good amount of divergences. But uh, this, of course, is can be numerically adapted by changing the parameter called uh, adapt delta, uh, adapt delta, which you already modified during your exercises. Um, but this is not a good solution. This does not guarantee uh, good sample. Better solution is to find the uh, the reason for the divergences, and this is reparameterization of the model. There's also additional statistic which is called EBM FMI, which I did not was covering, which is used for uh, estimating the potential energy, as as you can see, it also does not cover the, uh, the results. Also, there's an indication of high error hat values, which are here somewhat, uh, somewhat large, and this suggests, of course, bad mixing of the probability chain. Uh, chains. Here we can see it using the plot trace function in Arvis, uh, which will show us how the Markov chain behaves. Generally, all the Markov chain should behave, uh, should mix properly. As we can see, there are some issues with mixing. Here is the chain that is visible under it, that it has one strong maximum, other are or other spread. This one is very maximized, so this is a problem. With Theta is even worse, as you can see, chains are not mixing at all. In case of theta parameters, which are there are a lot of them, uh, they, he, this here is uh, uh, this here is completely not mixing the freezes. So there are a lot of lot of problems that we have here. And just to observe how the sampling occurs, we can see that having this shape probability distribution, this would be a very uh, the efficient way we should cover at least a bit of the funnel inside. And as you can see here, this is not looking that well. Initial samples are 
either are, uh, are around outside of the curvature or here ends. When we move to the actual sampling outside of warm up, we have a lot of divergences. Those divergence, though each red point is a divergence, so here the trajectory just destabilized completely. So there are problems with geometry. We can see here this geometry is very complicated. So now we will discuss one method of reparameterization to show you how to fix this problem just by simple techniques, uh, which require, of course, a bit of thought why we are using such techniques. And here is the non-parameterized, uh, non-centered, so-called non-centered models. Generally, the idea for non-centered parameterization is to remove the parameters from within the probability distributions and simplify it. And it relies on a very simple observation that it is completely irrelevant if theta is a normal distribution with a knee and standard deviation x of log tau, or if theta is generated from a normal distribution, standard normal distribution, so using eta parameter. So this is a variable with standard deviation of, the, uh, of 1 and, no, uh, and mean of 0, but multiplied by the st new standard deviation and shifted by a mean. So this is the formulation that move, uh, that removes those parameters of interest from inside sampling. So we are sampling normal distribution and then just transform those parameters algebraically. We get me, we get log tau, we get eta, and from that we can reconstruct theta, but we do it algebraically, not through sampling, but by algebraic transformation. And this algebraic transformation is much easier to do, to do and sampling for this part is much easier. And this is equivalent. This is a very beneficial solution. This happens often in so-called hierarchical models that we want to model the specifics of mean of the group. So we have elements coming from one group. Each of them has an individual mean, but the prior for that mean is common for all of them. And we want to estimate that common prior, this mean distribution. And that's why we then want to have uh, our, uh, our distribution in non-centered form to improve something. And does it improve something? Well, actually, it does. We can see it here that all the diagnostics are now very nice. This is the same model, the same non-existing data, just sampling for distribution, but all three depths are okay, no divergences, good EVMFI, good splitter hat, good effective sample size. And when we look at the variables, me has a mean very nicely close to zero with standard deviation of one, which is consistent with the prior. The same with for log tau, which is a division of five here. As you can see, number of effective samples is very large uh, because of ne some ne negative autocorrelations that we can uh, expect. So this is a very nice sampling. All the eta variables are, of course, 0, 1 distributed because that's how they should be. And theta variables are, of course, consistent with what we wanted uh, because we are getting large samples of eta in some places, so we get those parameters uh, can get very well, uh, very have a very big spread. And of course, because of this distribution, as you can see, this is uh, absurd values because they are being exponentiated. So mean is being transitioned because of one giant sample, because we can't generate a giant sample here because at the maximum, we can get or uh, like 30% of the samples can be, or 1.5% because of half of it, uh, can be above 10 to 10. So we can get a really giant outliers that will move our mean completely somewhere else. So these parameters are essentially not very normal, but they are still centered because they have their medians are equals to zero and uh, they have large, uh, large spread, but not like this. So they are, 
effectively not normal, which generally could be expected. And as we can see, no divergences. We can have a very nice sampling inside, uh, inside the typical set. And just to compose them, we can see a uh, zero plot. So we have normal distribution for all our variables here. We have good mixing here. Mixing here is irrelevant because those are algebraic functions. And as we can see, we have the uh, complete failure of uh, kernel density estimators, which just do not show us how the t-test behave properly in this set. But of course, as you can see, we can get a really large spread when we get a large standard deviation by exponentiation, which is, of course, possible here. But everything mixes nicely, everything works. If we look at the uh, histograms, for example, from theta 1, as you can see, there is a giant spike around 0, which is consistent with what we should get and some well-spread samples with results here. So this is the samples, these are the samples generated from our, uh, our distribution and they look uh, through reparameterization, moving to Hamilton and Monte Carlo solved all, all our problems, which would not necessarily be solved at all by traditional methods. So this generally covers the uh, idea of Hamilton and Monte Carlo that I wanted to uh, go you. Hamilton and Monte Carlo is the base of STAN. This is the method that we will be using in our projects and we will be using it in this course. And it's an, uh, currently one of the most efficient and well uh, and best understood methods for generating samples from probability distributions. As a reminder, we sample momentum, solve differential equations, which are automatically generated, and we drop the momentums to reconstruct the parameter samples in a proper way. So that's the general idea of Hamilton and Monte Carlo, and is this are, is the method that we wanted to use. So now, for those three people that are currently on the chat, uh, what are your questions? Because of course there are some. So what questions do you want to ask? Please write on the chat. Of course, we have some delay, so I'll wait a moment and prepare for the next part that will be moving. Certainly, there have to be some questions, so don't be afraid to ask them. Don't be afraid, you are almost anonymous on YouTube, so there is no problem. Too many windows. Okay, if there are no questions, then let's move to the next part of the, So we discussed something about discrete likelihoods, which is the... Generally, we will try to cover at least a bit some models that we can do uh, in Bayesian analysis in order to handle the problems. We will move, so we'll start with simple one-parameter models just to show you the ideas of discrete likelihood. Uh, for example, like Poisson distribution, which is a very popular method of uh, getting uh, of modeling the discrete, uh, discrete parameters in a situation that we, during a fixed interval, for example, daily or monthly, okay, there occurs a number of events. 
and we know that these events should occur with a constant mean rate and each of them is independent on the previous ones. Good examples are, for example, car accidents, uh, uh, network dropouts, uh, etc. All depends on the one parameter, parameter lambda, which also determines the mean and variance of distribution. What is, of course, important, lambda can be described by some kind of a link function. So it can be a function of some other parameters. So entire distribution, entire likelihood that corresponds to our data consisting of numbers of events is generated by a distribution depending on one parameter, which this parameter can be, of course, generated, uh, be a function of multiple parameters. So it's a, it's a number that can be a function of different numbers. So of course, this is very useful distribution because we often have uh, certain possibility of unbounded number of uh, events that we can uh, occur in a, in a given time and we want to be prepared for that event to be, um, uh, to, be to be modeled and to get some kind of for example dependencies on some kind of uh, predictors on what is happening example is for example how likely are you going to die on a plane uh, this is the, in case of uh, uh, what we want to do, uh, we'll cover an example of uh, data consisting of actual fatal accidents in the, uh, actual fatal accidents in the uh, in the planes in the 70s, uh, in the 70s and 80s. Uh, the second example, we will cover a different example, uh, 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 a cases of certain rare kidney cancer that show us the problem of representing the, uh, the uh, uh, events by data and not uh, uh, the, the, by that just data. Because it's very often simple that we would, what we would want to do is to get the number of uh, uh, we uh, something that we want to get is that we would like to take data treat it as a black box and just learn our model we know that in each region there were some so many uh, cancer cases so we can create our model that will be uh, corresponding to actual probability of kidney cancer and unfortunately, we'll see that this is not that simple. And uh, if the data is not standardized, there can become uh, some significant issues. So we will be considering, uh, in our case, uh, for cancer modeling, force of distribution, depending on the size of the population. Uh, so. Uh, of course, different ideas of such distribution would be Bernoulli distribution for a single binary trial. This is used for, for example, logistic equation uh, or exponential distribution that is used for waiting times or remain, modeling remaining useful lifetime of uh, of a device. So let's so let's start with the uh, airline uh, models. Again, we are having a simple model uh, that is the based on our data, we have a data set that's here uh, available uh, consisting of number of deaths, uh, years, uh, number of flights, actual death rates of one. So as you can see, we have the uh, number of fa fatal accidents with number, with number of passenger, uh, passenger deaths and the death rate uh, per miles flown. Uh, sorry, death rate per, uh, per an accident. So, an accident, usually, why is such uh, uh, Because when plane accidents happen, a lot of people die at the same time. If the, uh, there is rare situations that just one person died during, during a fatal accident. So, using a simple model, just to estimating uh, lambda, we can use so-called ideas for containment priors. Containment priors is an idea to say that, okay, 
I don't want to introduce hard boundaries to my data, to my model. For example, I don't want to say that the probability of uh, 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 accident should be too much. So, for example, I'm sure that we have uh, generally airline accidents do not happen. Again. So saying that one uh, having 365 accident per year, year, that would be a event of low probability. We want to we don't want to introduce a hard stop here. So okay, no more than 365. That why? Because in that case we introduce a line in our geometry of probability distribution. So we introduce a situation where if by some accident our differential equation from Hamiltonian and Monte Carlo encounter that line, there will be issues. There will be divergences, there will be problems. That's why we want to use so-called a containment prior. The prior that will fix, in this case, 99% of lambda in a way that will uh, be uh smaller than three, uh, 365 and for that of course we can use the uh, the aspect that our uh Poisson distribution has a mean of lambda and standard deviation of square root of lambda and approximately especially for big lambda normal approximation is very good uh it says that that lambda plus Three sigma, so plus three sub, mean plus three standard deviations should be, uh, be approximately 365, because that makes a situation uh, that nine, this is our boundary of 99%. Okay, so having that, we can determine this solution, which is generally a solution of a quadratic equation, and we can see that our uh, upper bound of for, uh, for lambda is 312. So we don't want, we want to have our lambda less than 312. And for that, we can use, for example, stan in order to determine. Here, here we have a stan code printed in the UPyter. We can uh, get the, we just want to fix the normal distribution in a way that will get this uh, half normal distribution. It will just not get more than nine uh, uh, than 312 in uh, necessary uh, quantile. So the, the probability of getting more than 312 should be one percent. So generally, this requires us to solving the uh, algebraic equation, which is, can be done using the using stan with transform data function and return it using the generated quantities. It's more efficient to do it on log scale from obvious reasons. Uh, and of course, this can be run in order to get that standard deviation for a half normal distribution for lambda should be 121. And in this case, 99% of lambdas generated by our prior will be less than 312, which corresponds to getting, on average, less than 365 accidents. For each of those lambdas, the average will be less than 365. So these are the containment priors, the priors that put a lot of, a certain amount of probability in the given interval, but still allow you, if data requires to move away, to move somewhere, it leaves you some space here. So it improves something, it introduces soft constraints, so it does not, uh, so it regularizes, uh, uh, makes your, your lambda reasonable, at least not absurd, not absurd. Uh, if you put uniform distribution for lambda, that would be problems because lambdas could be really, really huge and result would make no sense. So this Put it here, but introduce our expert knowledge about the effect without too strict condition. Uh, 
Uh, we can, of course, do the prior predicted distribution. So we can generate from our proposed model, generate, uh, propose, we can simulate possible number of accidents for each of the years. And so we sample from the half normal distribution with 121 standard deviation. Sampling from half normal distribution is just the absolute value of sample from the normal distribution. In case of the uh, in case of uh, sampling statements, we just introduce the constraint of zero on a, a variable that is distributed with normal, and will give us the same result. This kind of constraint is not a problematic one. Uh, okay, so we use our prior model, uh, we assign it data, so we just do it for one year. Uh, we because it's sampling, we just get the uh, fixed parameter is true, so we are not estimating parameters, we do not have parameters, we just have generated quantities. We generate the 1000 samples in one chain with a given C. So, as you can see, first of all, lambda is distributed as a half normal distribution, it's consistent with our prior, which is always good that our prior is not problematic and the number of accidents corresponding to actual data because you see in prior predicted distribution we plot the actual data to see what's going on but it at least does not contradict the existing data it is possible most probability is here it is possible to get more but it at least allows us to get our data our data would be possible to be generated from our distribution so moving from uh, prior uh, distribution, we can move to posterior uh, inference and uh, also all those codes are available in the old courses folder in the uh, 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 GitHub repository. So if you want to analyze it deeper by yourself, feel free, it's fully available. So, okay, uh, we do the uh, number, uh, our model now we provide with data, so number of year analyzes per each year we provide a number of paid accidents. This is actually a depreciated code now. Now we should specify it's an array of integers, but well, we need to do that. Uh, our parameters of course lambda, which has uh, uh, a lower on zero, uh, so we can generate it from normal distribution because of lower zero it becomes half normal with the standard division of 121, uh, and we get the who have, uh, uh, our model by by our likelihood by uh, that each of the measurements is distributed as a Poisson distribution with the same lambda and we simulate wise using generative quantities. A bit of sampling, we get uh, we can see the mean lambda is 24 with reasonable confidence interval of here. And as we can see, our very wide prior for lambda becomes completely contracted here. 85% high density interval for lambda is here, so it's relatively thin. Number of accidents is at least consistent with the results, possibly getting up to 48 now. But generally, we would want to use our model for predictions. So, there were 22 fatal accidents in 1986. Is our model consistent with getting such predictions with 546 passenger deaths and a death rate of 6% uh, per 100 miles, miles uh, flow? Uh, so, how our model consists that? We can, of course, do the median of predicted accidents is 24. Uh, with, com with very wide confidence interval. So, unfortunately, it is not a good result. And our model is very simple. It's rather logical the number of accidents should be at least related to how far we fly, and actually, more than that, do how many flights there are, because each of the fl uh, flights is. Uh, uh, determined by its flight, its own way, uh, by its risk. So uh, that's uh, using the Poisson. And here, as you can see, our one parameter number becomes 
uh, a model with a functional relationship for lambda. We have a theta parameter, what, still one parameter, both this representation, multiplied by a predictor number of uh, numbers of miles flown. Uh, this, of course, can be estimated again using uh, the same containing prior for theta can be computed by using average number of my, uh, miles flown, and we would get the upper bound of theta, which is now much smaller, to around 0 0.055. And from that, we get a sigma of 0 0.021, which is again gives a very nice containment prior for theta. Our prior predicted distribution, as we can see, still generates a half normal distribution. But now we need to look at each year individually, because in each year there was different numbers of miles flown, which is represented here in our models, that for each number of miles we use different theta. So, general idea still works, we just looking at each of the years, and as we can see, it's not that terrible. It's not that good also, but not that terrible. Uh, assuming that there's constant theta, at least the maximum value is here, but this is still predictive, uh, probability distribution. When we move to the posterior inference, then we have the uh, model, which again works the same way. We can, you can verify it in the repository, and uh, something that we provide with data, with miles, where uh, number of fatal accidents. And again, we can estimate the mean theta, its confidence interval, we can get some nice plots. Again, our prior was too wide, but of course, we do not get 365 accidents per year, even on average. And here is the uh, number of... Uh, uh, this is our... Uh, interval for theta. Again, with our predictions, as you can see, we're getting a system magnetic bias. In each of the years, it's either too much or too little for accidents. Only one year gives a central result. Why? Well, because year after year, there was changes in the numbers of flights, that's one thing, but also in technology and flying procedures, which are influenced here so we initially there was more accident than our model predicts and then there was less so here again using our model for predictions we get the numbers of miles that were flown in the next year and getting from <coughs> uh, getting from uh, from that we can see how our model uh, behaves and how it can predict and again it's consistent with what we observed here, it undervalues this parameter. So we can see that there is some relationship that our model does not capture. And then we can think how to do it. Maybe we could, for example, assign different mean for each of the years, but assign them a common prior, a hyper prior with parameters that we also want to estimate. Or we would like to introduce some kind of temporal relationship on theta. So, for example, get a theta as a function of some kind of baseline plus number of years since the start of the uh, of accident. For example, there will be a linear relationship, maybe not linear, maybe non-linear, multiple options for verifications, model can be improved in multiple ways. This is also an element that you could use for your projects, because as you can see, We've covered almost all of the steps. We've created two models for the same phenomena. They are not very good. You should go for better models. But uh, we analyzed the priors. We selected the priors with some kind of methodology. In this case, it was a containment prior. Using these containment priors, we, can, we, uh, we got the uh, inference with uh, inference model. We only did not add the... Uh, criteria for, for the uh, information criteria to compare these two models, uh, but this is something that is uh, that can be, of course, done relatively easy, uh, easily. So this is an example of something that would be a basis for projects. All the steps here are covered in order to perform 
appropriate uh, computation. Okay, uh, so this was an example of uh, discrete likelihoods. Uh, next time we'll cover some different likelihoods and different models, and uh, we will be covering that, uh, that later. Uh, uh, what are the questions now? Next lecture will also be on Friday with a live stream, unless I get uh, very active and I will be able to record something for you. Uh, that will be uh, put on the uh, on the YouTube as a bonus video to watch to cover for the lectures that we have lost before. Uh, okay, any questions? I don't see any questions. Uh, I'm not sure which is the date. There's only one person. If the person has any questions, you can find me on Teams or on email. Thank you very much and have a nice afternoon uh, and goodbye.